Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, today, uh, we are very happy to have Dong Chenge from University of Warsaw, and he's going to tell us about energy reflection and transmission at 2D holographic interfaces. So Dong Chen, please, the floor is yours. Thanks, Ignacio, and thanks for the invitation to keep a talk here. So what I'm going to talk about is based on work we put out last, uh, last June with my senior collaborators, uh, Costas Bacas, Giuseppe Policasso. Those are the professors at uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris and uh, Shia Chapman. Uh, she's now a faculty at Ben Gurion University. Although we put out like it has already been almost a year, I think due to the recent uh, interest in this kind of uh, uh, holographic model, I think it's still interesting to, to talk about that. Let's, let's start with um, um, some kind of brief introduction. So what we are studying here is actually some kind of interface physics. So this has a very long history and uh, this topic or this subject is very interesting and rich. The first example I can think of is, uh, is the diffraction of light in different media. Supposing that we have uh, two media system, um, one with water and one with air. When we, set, when we shoot a light from water towards the air, we'll have uh, some angles to depict this diffraction. And uh, the law govern such kind of uh, physical situation is given by the snail, snail's law. Uh, it can be formulated in terms of uh, this formula and one and two are the reflection index of uh, the two media. And uh, that's uh, a very simple and uh, uh, classical picture of uh, the interface physics. I did also more searches online and uh, it seems like in material science and the condensed matter physics, they have studied such kind of interface physics at um, much broader and uh, uh, deeper level. So some examples are like the crystal, crystallographic defect. So when you have a crystal, it's not necessarily that it's perfect. There might be some point defect, various different kinds of defects like a point one, the, lin the line one and the planar one and also the bulk one. Although in the later of the talk, I will talk more about the point uh, defect since we are in a very low dimension. There are also some uh, interesting topic in surface plasma. So what are those surface plasma? They are coherent delocalized electron oscillations and people can study, for example, the dispersion, dispersion relation in, in, in this surface plasma. And another very hot area is in terms of the graphene is, is a new material and people can study, for example, the surface conductivity or other stuff in those uh, condensed matter system. After this, there are still many, many other subdomains that study in the surface or interface physics. This is just a short introduction to tell you that it's a very rich and interesting subject of, uh, uh, about the interface physics. But those are more experiment uh, from the experimental point of view or phenomenological point of view. Today we want to or I want to tell you a kind of um, interface that is more theoretical. Uh, so we call them conformal interfaces. What are those interfaces? Supposing we have a d-dimensional Euclidean space and we have a CFT living in this Euclidean space time and in this space time, we can embed actually a p dimensional interface in this d dimensional Euclidean space. As we know, the conformal group for the d dimensional CFT, CFT so the, the theory with high symmetries, is the orthogonal group d plus one, the, comma one. After we introduce uh, this interface, this conformal interface, it is broken into two parts, the global symmetries. The first part is the orthogonal group of uh, the conformal interface, which is still a conformal group 
is p plus one comma one and then the, the rotation along the orthogonal directions for more details one can for example check the work of below and the minority in the 2016. In today's talk, I will focus more on, uh, on the low dimension, which is 1D equals to 2. As we know in this specific dimension, the CFT got very interesting and uh, uh, the symmetries got, got much bigger. It's become infinity for, for, uh, for the for the theory. So the symmetry has been enhanced to two copies of Virzorus. And uh, below here is an example of uh, a conformal interface in, in CFD2, CFD2 or in a general CFD, but I will mainly focus on CFD2. So we have two copies of CFDs on one side and on, on the other side. In the, in the middle, this black line is a kind of uh, uh, interface or gluing surface between the two CFDs. And this conformal interface, if it preserved one uh, copy of Virzora symmetry, then we call this to be a conformal interface in CFD2. So such kind of theories has been studied before, uh, can go back to 1996 by Oshikawa and Affleck, where they studied some spin uh, IC model of, of, the, of such kind of type of the gluing between two different uh, 2D CFTs. And in 2016, Keller, Hunker, and Watt uh, had more examples on rational CFTs of um, this type. Let's, uh, the next slide. Yeah. And uh, since we are talking about this conformal interface in 2D CFTs, I would like to give you more flavor of um, how we construct such conformal interface or, or do some more mathematical formulation in this theory. So as I said before, we can have uh, two generic CFDs um, in, in the space time. Uh, they are separated by this black line in the middle. And on the left side, it can have central charge CL. On the right hand side, it can have a different central charge CR. There needs to be some kind of condition if we want to glue these two CFTs together through the interface. And the gluing condition is actually comes from the continuity of the energy flux, which is the XT component of the stress energy tensor. In terms of the left mover and right mover language, we can uh, rephrase this continuity of the energy flux in terms of uh, the difference between the left mover and the right mover. So when they are evaluated on the interface, they have to be equal to each other. In this way, we mean that there's no local energy, some localized energy on the interface. Another way people usually think about such gluing is through folding trick and uh, so the folding trick is that we can fold the green surface to the left side and then this interface will become a boundary of this system it, with this boundary existing we can we can uh, define a kind of boundary state that has to be annihilated by a certain combination linear combination of the virzora generators in this form. So Lm minus L bar minus N and uh, also the, the same thing on the right side, on the right, on the right side of the CFT. This is just a more detailed form of uh, the continuity of the energy flux. And in this way, if so, in this formula, actually, if we package left and right together, then we can see clearly that um, imposing such boundary condition will preserve one copy of uh, Virzora symmetry along the interface. As we all know that in CFD, we, we can obtain all the information from the stress, stress uh, from the correlation function. 
And uh, here we are more interested in the generic feature or universal feature of, uh, of the theory, meaning we don't want to uh, specify what is the CFT and the, what are the states we are considering. So we look at the stress-stress correlation function and the, the universal information can, uh, was encoded in the correlation functions up to three-point function. And those, uh, yeah, so some special feature in, in presence of the interface is that if we consider the, the correlation function between the left mover on the left side and the left mover on the right side, this two point function, if there is no um, uh, interface, actually the, the, the transport coefficient will be which will be, will, if, if the two theories are decoupled from each other, then um, this, two co this correlation function will be zero identically. However, since now we are considering a more interface case there, we could allow something to go from the left side to the right side. And then we will have a new parameter that characterize the two-point function of uh, these two uh, operator. And uh, this new parameter is different from the central charge CL and the C right. Uh, so what is the physical meaning of um, this new parameter? And uh, that's what brings us to, to understanding the, the energy transport in, in this setup. And the, the the answer for, for that is that we can relate the, 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 the new parameter in the two-point function to the transport coefficient of, uh, of, of in this setup. So usually when we consider this energy transport, we will perform a kind of scattering experiment. And that's how we do it. We will shoot a kind of wave package from the left side towards the right side. And when this wave package, uh, wave package hit on the interface, it will be scattered. So there are two contributions coming out. One is the reflected piece and the other is the transmitted piece. Of course, we will always have the energy conservation, which means the incident wave will the energy of the incident wave will be the sum of the reflected one and the transmitted one. In the work of uh, Keller, Honka, and Watt, uh, we can define some kind of scattering matrix uh, representing this process. And this scattering matrix is defined, uh, of course, in the folding picture and in terms of the Virzero generator at level two um, both theories. So IJ means either left or right. And uh, since we have this boundary state, it is in the folding picture language. And, and all the higher, higher uh, levels of uh, virtual generators can be reduced in terms of uh, the level two operators. So um, this scattering matrix is quite uh, useful and yeah, we only need the level two to define it. And then there comes our, the, the quantity we would like to study, which is the uh, reflect, uh, reflection coefficient and the transmissive coefficient. In terms of the scattering matrix, we can write it in this way. And then the reflective coefficient will be one minus two CL, right? where CO right is the new coefficient uh, appearing in the two-point function, in the two-point uh, functions. And the transmission coefficient will be written in terms of uh, two CLR over CL plus CR. Once it clearly, this two will, when we sum R and uh, T, it will give us one. So the energy is conserved in, in, in this scattering experiment. And so far, we only talked about the CFT 
like the, the transport coefficient from the CFD side. And uh, we would like to, there are two fundamental questions we can ask based on the spirit of ADS CFD or gravity gauge duality. So the first question we could ask is that, what is the gravitational dual of the scattering coefficients? Meaning the, trans, the, the, the reflection coefficient and the transmission coefficient. The second question is, uh, is, is harder to, 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 to answer. And uh, the question is that, can one reproduce the stress-stress correlators holographically? Although we know that the universal pieces of these two, uh, of the stress-stress correlator will be up to three-point function. And this question is uh, harder to answer. So you see, although we, we have, like we know ADS-CFT for more than, it, it exists more than 20 years, but so far, um, this kind of calculation or this kind of answer hasn't been obtained. And in today's talk, we will focus more on the first question, which we have um, uh, known the answer. And that's the paper uh, we put out last uh, summer. And for the second question, it's uh, harder to answer. And we are still working on it. Hopefully, we could report our analysis and results in the future. So now let's start to attack the first question. Yeah, I hope so far there's no question or is there any question? Okay, so in order to understand the, the gravitational picture, we need some kind of gravitational model to understand. And uh, this has been conjectured to be the thin brain model. It can have a uh, higher dimensional uh, embedding. So what is this thin brain model we're considering? It's actually a one dimensional lower tensile ADS brain, which is embedded in the bulk ADS space time. And in, in our consideration, we are actually considering an ADS2 brain that is embedded in ADS3. Although the, the ADS radii on, on the both sides could be different, but then we need some uh, like more detailed gluing condition. This gravitational picture or this thin brain model recently has um, uh, received a lot of uh, attentions. So I just uh, list uh, uh, the falling, although it can never be non-exhaustive. Non the first one is definitely related to the information paradox. Uh, when people considering island and uh, construct uh, and obtaining the, the page curve with the, the transition. So it starts from the work appeared in 2019 by Alameri, Mahayam, Manasen and Zhao. And there are following works um, by Van Hamstock uh, and the collaborators and uh, uh, Myers and the collaborators. So Ignacio was also working, has also been working on this. And the spirit in, by using this doubly holographic model is that can be, can be simplified to, to this case. When we are in the, considering the entanglement entropy uh, in, for example, this is in the uh, Poincaré coordinate. We have an interval and the RT surface, if the interval is far from the boundary, then it is the usual RT surface we have. But once when the interval is approaching the boundary, it will have some kind of uh, new pieces, which is, uh, which is, is uh, a disconnected um, RT surface and uh, this kind of phenomenon uh, is like the phase transition and the, the pieces on the, on the brain, or on, in, this, in this case, it will be the end of the world brain. So the blue pieces will be the island that people 
and nowadays referring. And a lot of details of such work can be can be referred to um, the work of uh, Myers et al. in 2020. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, so I've uh, I've seen this figure before. Sorry, I can't hear you. Figure that you are showing. Yes. Can you hear me? Uh, no, I've seen this figure before, but I've never quite understood why it is drawn this way. Uh, can you tell me what 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 is the meaning of those two edges meeting at the corner? Why do they meet at a corner? Uh, uh, you if mean that, if that is not too naive a question? Yeah. This one, right? Yes. So yeah, once... what what is going on there? I don't know. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, to have a short answer, so this is still uh, you can see my mouse, right? So. This part is still the, 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 the interval on the boundary. And now we want to calculate what is the, the bulk duo of the entanglement entropy for this interval. And uh, then uh, effectively, we can imagine that there are some piece on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the end of the word brain. And then when we minimize the, the, the RT surface for, for, for this interval, when it is approaching to the boundary, then the interface at the RT surface will, so originally uh, before it will be connected. And after it's reaching the boundary, it will be contained two pieces. One is this one, the small, the small uh, arc, and the other one is the bigger one. So this will give us, um, uh, uh, yeah, it, that that surface will now become the minimum. So there is a phase. That means that that's why we say there is a phase transition. Okay. So so the so the one one horizontal line that's the conformal boundary of your bulk space. Uh, right. So yeah, yeah. So the and the horizontal line is the conformal boundary, and the right. the, the tilted that this this line is the end of the word brain end of the world brain. Again, I've, I've heard that many times, but I've, I've never quite understood what that means. Uh, so basically, it means that we have some kind of brain and it can back react on the geometry. So for a half ADS, it is the, the dotted line. This is the, the, the bulk space is from the boundary till the dotted line. But after we introduce a kind of brain structure at, at the end of the world boundary, at the end of the word, it can back react on the on the geometry, and it gets some uh, extra pieces here. We, why we but call it? Is, we call it the just end another, of. Uh, so sorry, it's just another ADS manifold embedded, lower dimensional ADS manifold embedded in the bigger ADS manifold. Right. Is so this 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 kind of brain is still a lower dimensional ADS brain, except that okay. now. Uh, outside this brain, there is no space time. So that's why we call it the end of the world. I see, I see. Okay, all right, thanks a lot. Thank you. And there are also some uh, work related to complexity consideration. For example, uh, we have worked out like almost three years ago to test the, the holographic complexity conjectures in, in this model. And there are also some, uh, uh, and this here we have shown that there are, uh, in, in terms of, uh, in presence of the defect, there are difference between the two holographic conjectures, meaning the volume conjecture and the action conjectures. There are also some uh, higher dimensional generalization or the, the uh, by imposing different boundaries in terms of this direction. And there is also the latest work relating to complexity is the past and grow complexity. So in, uh, those are the work of uh, Tadashi and the Pavel and the Yan, which appeared last year. And there are also some uh, uh, more detailed examples that we are working in progress. So basically in this past and to grow complexity, we are maximizing, we are integrating the, um, the heart, uh, the, the, the space from the UV cutoff to some kind of fixtures brain. 
and uh, then we need to maximize the Harto Horkin function to get uh, so the maximization of the Harto Horkin function will be will give us the the complexity. I think probably in the future Pavel will report this progress. Yeah. Since this is the main setup we're considering today, it's better to tell you more about what is the thin brain model we are using here. And in this slide, I'm going to give a little more details. It might be slightly technical, but I hope it's still understandable. Uh, in this picture, what I have drawn here is the ADS. It's actually a time slice in ADS3 Poincaré coordinates. The orange lines are the asymptotic uh, boundaries of ADS or the conformal boundaries. And uh, we put the brain in the red vertical line. So the time direction, there is a time direction is actually pointing towards us, meaning outside of the, 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 the screen. And uh, the blue shaded region is due to the back reaction of the existence of this brain. Uh, this back reaction uh, can be obtained. So we need to solve the Einstein equation to obtain this back reaction. And the result can be drawn in terms of this way. And there are two angles that are important to characterize the back reaction of the brain, uh, which are marked by theta L and the theta right. On the left side of the shaded region, it's uh, half ADS3, which are empty ADS. And on the right hand side, it's also the half empty ADS. Although they will have different ADS radii, L left and L right. This kind of setup actually is a, a specific example of uh, Cash random brain. And uh, Costas in 2002, he studied such kind of uh, gluing in more details and uh, also extended to the case that the, the radii of the, the ADS radii on both sides could be different. And the result is that the space stable solution exists in such certain range when the brain tension is less than the sum of the inverse ADS radii while larger than the absolute value of the difference of the two. The, yeah, the back reaction of this geometry can be depicted in terms of this gluing condition. And uh, the gluing condition tells us that the ratio between the ADS radii over cosine of this angle will be dependent on the, on the tension. So one, case, one specific case we can consider in here is that when theta L and the theta right goes to zero simultaneously, or if theta L goes to zero, theta right has to go to zero as well. What does it mean? It means that the brain tension has to be zero. Let's see if this agrees with our formula here. When theta L or theta right goes to zero, these two terms are still finite while tangent theta and the tangent theta goes to zero, that means theta zero has to be, a theta has, a sigma has to be zero, sorry, sigma, sigma is the brain tension. Sigma has to be zero in this case, and this agrees with our intuition. If the angles goes to zero, then that means our tension becomes zero. Yeah, is there any question? Uh, I have a question. Dongsheng, could yes, you please. elaborate a bit on uh, the stability condition? So what happens if you're outside this region of stability? What happens to the brain? Right. Yeah. Okay. So the two bonds, the upper bonds and the lower bonds. So the upper bonds has a name, which is uh, called the, um, the Randall syndrome uh, bonds. And it basically tells us if our brain tension exceeds this value, it will no longer be the ADS embedding, rather it will be the DS embedding. So that's what the meaning of the upper bonds. And the lower bonds is actually called the 
Coleman de Lucia bond. And uh, it's somehow related to the nuclearization, or bubble nuclearization. Uh, I know that's only by words, but another way to see where are those two bonds coming from is by looking at this gluing condition. And uh, mm, there are some, uh, so theta L and the theta right, uh, theta R, they will have some range. It cannot be arbitrary. So both angles will, will be uh, inside the range from zero to pi over two. And by taking that into consideration, one can also arrive at this stable solution. Would that be good enough? Okay, yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, so we, 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 we have an effective, we actually have an effective action to describe this kind of setup. Besides the Einstein-Hilbert term, which are the Bach terms on the left side and on the right side, we also have some extra terms. One of them is the brain tension term. And the other terms we can write is actually the gibbons yog hawking term, although we have no boundary, but this term is useful uh, in the sense that it will give us the correct boundary condition. And when we write those gibbons yog hawking term here, it's actually uh, one on the left side of the brain and one on the right side of the brain. It looks like the brain has been sandwiched by these two uh, extrinsic curvatures. So the bracketed notation is written as the, it denotes the difference between the two extrinsic curvatures or the two, the two different quantities on the right, on the left side, on the, on the right side. Uh, we can write the effective action in those terms is because that we have assumed the continuity of the induced metric. So once when we take, when we do some variation with respect to this action, the set of points gives us that, um, gives us the, the its real junction condition. What it tells us is that the jump of the extrinsic curvature, so sorry, those are not absolute values. Those are the, are the square bracket. The, so this formula tells us the jump of the extrinsic curvature will be proportional to the brain tension. To obtain this boundary condition, we have assumed that we will have the Neumann boundary condition on this brain. So the variation of the metric will still allow the variation of the induced metric. Great. So, so far we considered two models. One is the interface model in the CFT side and the other is the steam brain model in the bulk side. And the question we had in mind is that what is the gravitational dual of the scattering coefficients or in terms of the new parameter in the two point functions. And the, in our work, we would like to relate these two in uh, the, the CLR to the brain tension sigma. And in the, in the boundary CFT side, we have already seen that this can be formulated in terms of the in the scattering process of the scattering experiment. And what we are going to do now is to perform a similar ex scattering experiment, but in the holographic setup. And we call this to be the holographic scattering experiment. Something I would like to mention here is that there are actually Mm, some previous work who have also considered uh, such model and uh, relate the brain tension to be a kind of information quantity on the boundary, which is the boundary entropy. And those are the works of uh, Tadashi and the collaborators. So what they have claimed is that Supposing we will have an, an RT that is connecting to the, to the end of the word brain, then the extra pieces coming from the existence of the end of the word brain will be, uh, will be labeled as the uh, boundary entropy. And uh, uh, so this red arc will be a, will, okay. 
it can be relate is a function of the brain tension. So in this way, they relate the boundary entropy to the brain tension. So, so far there is one case that we haven't really understood, which is the topological interface case, uh, which I might say a little bit more in the, in, in the end of the, this talk. And uh, in the topological interface case, actually the brain tension will go to zero, but we know that in the, in the, in the, in the CFT point of view, for topological interface, we can still have uh, arbitrary boundary entropy. And uh, I think this issue rem still remain to be understood. Mm, yeah, just uh, to mention, there's another interpretation of uh, this, uh, this brain tension. And uh, we think it's another facet of this, the, the full story. So now I would like to tell you how to do this holographic scattering experiment and what we can, whether we can relate the things we want in this setup. Yeah, let's start this experiment. So we still, let's look at this picture first. We have the two uh, plane, these two gray planes. So those are the uh, ADS boundary, asymptotic boundary, the conformal boundary. And uh, on the on the boundary, we will have we will perform the scattering experiment as before. We we will shoot some kind of um, incident wave, and it will get scattered on the interface labeled by P. And the brain is this kind of shaded uh, region on both sides. So so far, those are two chunks of the geometry, and uh, later we will glue them together. In this case since we, we want to perform the scattering experiment, we need to turn down some kind of uh, source or wave packet. And the work of Skanderis and Solodokin in, 1990, in 1999 helps us because they have uh, given the exact solution uh, for ADS-3 in terms of the Feffman-Graham gauge. It will terminate at the fourth order so that's an exact solution. And the second order will be quite useful for us because it gives the expectation value of the stress energy tensor on the boundary. And that's what we are going to turn on for, uh, for our holographic scattering experiments. One thing to pay attention here is that we only turn on the, the expectation value of the uh, stress tensor, but not the source. So the zeros order will still be flat. To prepare the scattering states, um, the holographic scattering states, what we actually do is to fluctuate the brain. That's why we draw it in a fluctuating manner. So it's actually to fluctuate the brain mildly or weakly. And, to, and this can be given or can be formulated in terms of uh, the following answers, where we have uh, some we will add some extra term to the uh, to the metric. So the first term is the incident wave. Uh, so far, we are doing things for for on the left side. Uh, we write the the metric in terms of the um, the light cone coordinates. So x plus minus means that uh, t plus minus z. In the first uh, term, we'll have the, the incident wave, which propagates at 45 degrees towards the interface. And uh, since on the left side, we will receive some reflecting contribution. So that's, where, that's why we'll have the second piece labeled by the reflective coefficient and that's the coordinate system on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we will have uh, the transmissive part labeled by T left. So those are of order epsilon, meaning weakly fluctuating the brain. The energy conservation will tell us that the 
incident wave will be a sum of uh, reflected one and the transmitted one. Our coordinate on the left side and on the right side so far are different from each other. And now we would like to do the gluing, meaning that we want them to be in the same uh, space time, not two different chunks. In order to do the gluing, we need to know what are the gluing conditions. And, but before that, we need to match the coordinates. So we will need to find some common coordinate, z, t, and the x uh, to, to, to relate the left coordinate to this common coordinate and the right coordinate to this common coordinate as well. And this will introduce us to six more functions that dependent on the ADS radial direction, which we call it theta, lambda, and the delta. In the third equation, we can see that uh, we have initially put the brain at x equals to zero, meaning the common coordinates equals to zero. If we turn off the fluctuations, meaning that epsilon goes to zero, we will see that immediately the two coordinates on both sides are equal to each other. It will be the same coordinate. The gluing condition, as uh, I've mentioned, will be the first one, continuity of the induced the metric on the brain, and the second one, the jump of the extrinsic curvature due to the existence of the tensile brain. So alpha and beta runs from one to two, they are surface quantities. Simply speaking, there will be six equations. However, since we are looking at the unshell solution, there are two that will be redundant due to the momentum constraint that if we act the, the surface covariant derivative on this equation, it will automatically be zero. That means if one of the equation has been solved in the second uh, uh, covariant equation, then the other two will be automatically satisfied. Function? Yes. Uh, could you go back one slide? Um, uh, I mean, oh, yeah, so I understand that in the boundary, you're throwing this wave packet. Yeah. Uh, so could you repeat what is, the what is going on in the bulk? You're not sending a wave packet in the bulk. So in the bulk, um, we can actually think of them as um, those, those are different layers in the, at a constant Z direction. And in each direction, we are performing a kind of the same wave on each layer of, uh, so each different Z, we are performing the same uh, uh, wave packet since you see that the, oh no, sorry, that's what's wrong. Yeah, okay, here is the answer. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, this x plus or x minus are the coordinate in terms of t and z. So that means you see the metric at the second order is actually dependent on the z coordinates. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, maybe we need to plot that to see how it will give us the picture in, in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, wait, wait, wait. I think I'm confusing myself. Right, right, right. So you see uh, Z and uh, no T and X will be written in terms of the surface quantities that including T and Z. And here the X plus it's x no no the x plus is in terms of uh, t and x so in a way in the end the after this proper pro, propagation so the z coordinate will also come in inside uh, this x minus and x plus right but in this metric if i go away from the brain yeah uh, is this metric this is not locally ads3 this is uh, locally ADS3, I think. Okay, so 
I mean, at the beginning when we, I thought this was like some kind of gravitational wave or something, but it's not that. It's, but, it's a kind of boundary graviton. Okay, it's like a, okay, 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 okay. Yeah, okay. I think yeah. I yeah. Yeah, but it's a good question. I, yeah, I haven't been able to visualize what you are saying, like what is the bulk picture, but after this propagation, indeed, those terms will be dependent on the ADS radius, ADS, the radial direction of ADS. So somehow. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I see, I see. Yeah. Okay, okay, good, thanks. Yeah, that's a good question. Thanks. Yeah, so, so far we have uh, six new functions and uh, from um, this gluing condition we we'll also have six equations so in in a generous in general we can we can solve those equations uh, but as we said there are two redundant equations so how can we see from um, those functions that means two should somehow be redundant uh, that comes immediately if we rename the functions so we will rename theta as the difference between left and right quantities and lambda also as the difference between left and right. So those two quantities, since it's uh, theta and the T, they are actually a kind of surface, surface T field along the, the, the brain, uh, on the brain. So those are like, we can fix them up to some gauge choice on the brain. These are surface T fields. And the third one is uh, is the displacement or the 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 expectation value of the displacement since those are related through this x the transverse direction of the interface on the bound, uh, on the CFD side, and we also rename another function as the the linear combinations, the weighted the linear combinations of the uh, the other functions. Um, after some efforts, one can rewrite those equations in terms of the new functions we have obtained here. And uh, uh, as we have ex expected, there are two equations that will be redundant. So the independent equations will be the following four. Um, yeah, we have also uh, absorbed some phase factor in, inside this, uh, this transport coefficient. And yeah, in general, those are just uh, uh, linear differential uh, linear differential equations. So they will they will be able to be solved. And the way to solve it is first to look at the, the homogeneous part and solve the homogeneous uh, equation, and then add in the non-homogeneous part and solve in the the full equations. To get some of the physical quantities that we are interested in, I was mainly looking at the, the first equation and the third equation. And uh, this can be yeah, solved in the way that I have proposed. In the next slides, I'm going to give you the solution of this equation. And actually I have given the solution in terms of this delta. Delta is a linear combination of uh, those three functions relating to the transverse direction and uh, one direction of the, uh, on the brain. The first, the two terms are the, um, comes, from, comes from the, uh, the homogeneous part of the equation and uh, it will have uh, two different coefficients in terms of those two propagating wave and there are some other terms. So let's first look at what are the physical meaning of those two waves. Here I have redrawn the, the bulk picture. So the, the red line will be the, uh, the brain. Those two terms are the propagating waves along the, the brain. One goes, to, go, go, goes towards the Poincaré horizon labeled by A minus, which is this one. And the other one will go towards the ADS boundary, which is A plus. 
there are some um, difficulty or uh, some um, improper issues that we have met in, in these solutions. Those issues are, uh, are relating to those uh, wave packages because in, in those uh, wave package, we, we see packages that we see uh, they will propagate at uh, speeds that, uh, that is faster than the light. So those are superluminal waves. How come there could be superluminal waves? The way we think about it is that it's like when we have an oblique seashore and the, the, the sea waves will propagate towards this seashore at an angle. So it seems like they will have from the other pers uh, from the oblique uh, direction, if we uh, measure the speed of the wave, it will be superluminal, but actually um, that's a different, uh, in, in this consideration, it will be a different uh, gauge consideration. Uh, it, based on that, we need to consider a quantity that is its gauge invariant. Here is the gauge invariant quantity uh, we found, or the easiest one we can think of, is the extrinsic curvature on the, on the surface. So it will be gauge invariant, meaning that the surface diffuse won't um, change the, the, the extrinsic curvature. And we especially look at the trace list part of the extrinsic curvature. It's expected that it would, will come out at the linear order of the perturbation. And uh, here we will see the two waves that we have in this solution. So one propagating towards the Poincaré horizon and the other towards the ADS boundary. Since we will have these two kinds of waves, we would like to think which wave is more physical than the others. So those situations has been studied before, for example, in the paper of Skanderis and Van Ries in 2008. And what they are considering is that there shouldn't be any wave that coming out from the Poincaré horizon. So meaning that we should kill the A plus wave while preserve the A minus wave. By doing that, we said this A plus wave goes to zero. We will relate the transport coefficient, actually the, the directional transmissive coefficient from the left-hand side to the, to, to right, to, uh, we'll relate this quantity to the angles we have seen before. So those angles in, in the end will be translated to the brain tension in, the, in, in terms of the matching uh, gluing condition that I have shown before. To save your effort, I will just give the result, which is written in terms of um, the weighted average transmission. So we need to weight the directional transmission coefficient with, the, with its weight, which is the ADS radii. And that's our main result in this paper. It's a very simple formula and contains the brain tension inside. Once you see that, it is actually, the, the transmission coefficient is actually monotonically decreasing in, uh, with the, the, the brain tension. So when the tension goes to zero, the, <clears throat> uh, the, the tension will be the minimum, but actually we know that the tension doesn't go to zero, it will, if the, the left-hand side and the right-hand side ADS radii will be different. By using this formula and apply the, the bonds of the tension into this formula, we will have some kind of bonds on the transport coefficient from the holography, from, from the thin brain model we are considering. And uh, there are two bonds. The upper bonds is 2C right over CL plus C right. Uh, since we assumed in our calculation that C, the, the, the left central charges, the left central, the right central charge is smaller than the left central charge. And it will also have a, um, a lower bound, which is two CL CR over the sum squared. There are several comments I would like to make here. The first one is that the upper bound of the transmission coefficient 
actually agrees with the ANIC bound, meaning the average now energy condition bound, uh, which has been shown in the paper of uh, Penedones et al. in 2019. And they also commented that this ANIC bound will be strictly smaller than the reflection positivity bound. So the reflection positivity is actually the Euclidean version of the unitarity in the, in the uh, QFT theory. Another comment is that the lower bound from holography is actually stronger than the unitary, unitary bound, which is zero. And this is somehow, um, yeah, not fully understood why this happens, but um, that's the result. Two other comments I would like to make here is that there are two extreme cases one can consider. The first case is the totally transmissive interface when T goes to one. And this can only happen when CR equals to C left. Meaning that the two central charges has to be equal. An intuitive way to understand that is that uh, we need the degrees of freedom on both sides to match with each other. So, uh, and then we can have this totally transmissive uh, case because if, for example, CR is less than C right, we are sending wave from C left to C right. Then on the left side, it will have more degrees of freedom of, of obviously the left side cannot hold all the degrees of freedom. The second uh, extremal case is the totally reflective one when the transmission coefficient becomes um, zero. And this can happen only when CL is much, much larger than C right. So this will become zero in this limit. And the physically, it means that we are depleting the degrees of freedom on on one side, here is the right hand side. So we are really uh, depleting the ADS space or the CFD on the right hand side. And this goes back to the BCFD setup, which is reasonable. Yeah, I think it's uh, good to summarize what we have considered. In, in this work and uh, tell you about some, maybe some future interesting topics. So what we have, what I have shown you just now is that the transport coefficients, which carries the universal information of the CFT, it's universal in terms of uh, two point correlators and up to three point correlators. And we have successfully uh, matched this transport coefficients to the brain tension in the thin brain model. And the holographic bound uh, tells us that the anic bound, uh, the upper bound coincides with the anic bound, but the lower bound is stronger. There are some certain issues that we haven't really understood. One issue is uh, how is our, our uh, consideration related to the previous consideration on the boundary entropy. So can we make more precise connection between the energy transport to the boundary transport, especially in the topological interface case where boundary entropy can be arbitrary and the brain tension should be zero. Maybe there are some subtle issue um, between or some deeper issue in the understanding of energy transport and the information transport. And this we couldn't really answer so far, or maybe because uh, uh, those are the different facets of the same theory. And in the bulk side, we are mainly looking at the classical geometry. Um, so that um, is an effective theory. Maybe in that sense, we cannot really distinguish the two, um, but it's still interesting to to, to go deeper to understand what are the difference between the two. And 
there might be some other interesting directions. So for example, we can consider some excited states and uh, this will, um, for example, and some easier case in ADS3 is the BTZ setup that maybe one can also consider the thermal CFDs on the, on the boundary side and uh, finding the, the brain construction in the bulk side. And then since those two CFDs, maybe we can put them into different temperatures and there might be some thermal transport that would also be interesting to understand if they can be uh, characterized in in a universal way, maybe not in a universal way, but in some in terms of some interesting quantities. So there should be some other interesting transport to consider, and maybe one can also introduce some kind of current in the in the setup. And then we are looking at some different excited states, and yeah, this is some direction we also would like to explore. And uh, re relating our story to the to the up to date page curve calculation, um, since in the in the page curve calculation, especially in the second paper of uh, Alameri and uh, Mandesena and the, the other collaborators, they are considering the ADS two gluing to a pure CF to to uh, an empty CFT, and in that case they use the totally transparent boundary condition, which means that it's totally transmissive boundary condition. Um, yeah, it would be interesting to understand if our setup or by, by looking at not transparent condition or more general a more general boundary condition, whether one could learn more about the islands and there are many, many more to explore. It's, uh, it's a very uh, interesting topic and uh, it will be very fruitful to understand uh, the, uh, things in, in, in this setup. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, that's all for my talk today. Okay, Dong Cheng, thank you very much. It's a very interesting talk. Um, I do have some questions, but I'll let um, others start. Um, so, questions. In that case, let me start. Um, I mean, I have several questions actually, but okay. Uh, but one of them is um, so here you were using the tension of the brain as somehow like, like a free parameter that you could vary between these two bounds. Right. Um, now, of course, here things are quite subtle because because the brain has a two-dimensional geometry. But in principle, if if one if one could think of higher the, the setup you have, but in higher dimensions, or even the same setup that you have in in three dimensions, um, I'm wondering if like there's a I'm thinking about the theory that is defined on the brain because mm -hmm. if you go back, it's a, maybe you can go back where you had the Israel uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so here, right, so here for the brain, you're just, you're basically putting just a tension term. Right, right? and uh, yeah, and the, the, the extrinsic curvature that sandwich the brain. And, but now you could take this action, right, and, and reduce it, integrate the bulk to find the induced action on the brain. Right. Uh, and I was wondering, now that, of course, it, I mean, in, in this case, this is going to give you some complicated mm -hmm. two-dimensional gravity, but that's fine because you wouldn't expect it to be otherwise. But if you go to higher dimensions, this is going to give you the series of uh, higher curvature gravities. 
which yeah. can simplify in a certain limit of the tension, right? Tension when, when the tension becomes maximal, so one over L left plus one over L right, I guess. Um, yeah. So I'm in that like, case, mm -hmm. yeah, I think I know. Um, yeah, what you are talking about actually is uh, quite related to your work with uh, Rob and the other collaborators. And uh, yeah, indeed, I haven't really fully understood how the higher curvature terms can appear, for example, even in the simplest case, like in, in this um, uh, 3D ADS3 setup, you can integrate it, the bulk uh, curvature till this, uh, this brain, and then you will have some higher and the nonlinear curvature terms on the, on, on the brain. Um, yeah, those might reduce to the, the polyac of action mm -hmm. on the brain. And uh, then indeed it's, uh, it seems to look like a 2D gravity theory, but uh, yeah, I, 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 I I haven't figured out how these two are related to each other. Like in, in this effective action and the the one that you wrote in your paper. So that's also think, remiss. Yeah, this would be interesting to look at because then you would have a sort of third perspective of what you're doing, right? You have the boundary perspective, which is super clear what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You have this three-dimensional bulk perspective, which is also clear what you're doing, but it's but it's rather complicated. And then you could have a third perspective, equivalent perspective, which would be this effective theory on the brain. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you have to integrate the bulk. Um, but that, as you said, like this is going to be in general a complicated theory, but what I'm trying to say is that in a specific limit of the tension, this might become a simple gravity theory. Mm -hmm. um, Although things are a bit tricky because you're in two dimensions, so um, it's there. Like um, in higher dimensional cases, is it more clear? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Definitely yes. Because in higher dimensions, when you reduce, when you integrate the the on shell action in the three dimensional bulk up to the brain. What you're going to get on the brain is simply going to be Einstein gravity plus these higher curvature terms, uh -huh. whose coefficients are going to be controlled by some ratio of the tension to some other thing. Uh -huh. And these things you can make very small if you want. And that's the limit I was I was talking about before. So, okay. And you require the tension to be small, or it's not necessary. No, actually, you you in this case, I'm not sure exactly in your setting, but in the more standard one in which you have the two sides uh, equal. Mm -hmm. The Z2 would, symmetry case. Right. You would require the tension to be maximal or close to maximal mm -hmm. so that the theory induced on the brain is Einstein gravity. But anyways, we can talk about this. Uh, we should talk about this. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, I think I time. got your idea. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thanks. More questions? Maybe I ask a quick, small question. Uh, uh, you can hear me, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yes. loud and okay. clear. So uh, I see your construction and it's uh, for me as not knowing this construct uh, construction, it seems a bit, uh, um, hopefully it's not too rough, but like arbitrary. So wh why this construction? How can you show that this is uh, really giving you a conformal interface and not such simply some interface? Uh, so ah, how okay. is this gluing condition really related to a conformal gluing condition? So how can you can you show this? So can you show that um, like the energy momentum tensor at this? So here you, you draw, like uh, if I understand it correctly, there is this tilt. And at this mm -hmm. tilt, you assume there is this defect yeah. or interface. And then uh, how to show that this should be a conformal interface and not something that simply breaks all conformal symmetries possible. Right. Thanks for this question. I haven't uh, explained this point. So the, the way to see it is uh, in terms of the isometries in the bulk side, since in the um, in ADS3, we know that the global symmetry group, it's SO22. 
and uh, the global symmetry group is uh, the global isometry group for ADS3 is equivalent to the global conformal group. And why this interface is a conformal interface? It's a conformal interface in the sense that it is a, an ADS2 embedding, so it's a lower dimensional embedding. And this preserve uh, SO2-1 symmetry. And uh, if we compare to the conformal uh, case, uh, the global conformal symmetry group, group, then we see that it's basically uh, the conformal uh, the, the conformal brain. It will be more clear in the in the in the higher dimensional case because then uh, the conformal groups are just fixed by the SO uh, D plus uh, D two comma two, and uh, then this brain will be S O D minus one two. So indeed, it is a conformal embedding in that sense. So in higher dimension, it seems clearer because there you have like the right amount of symmetry preserved. But yeah, I don't see it fully in 2D. So who, where, where's the whole, whole Virazoro? <laughs> uh, <laughs> One copy of Virazoro kind of preserved. Uh, or, or can right. you relate this, this gluing condition you write on the right somehow to the gluing condition uh, yeah. for, the, for the energy momentum tensor? Yeah, that's, this a, is... that, mm -hmm. that's a good question. So in, in ADS3, we know that uh, the, the Virazoro groups in ADS3 comes from the asymptotic boundary. So one can use, for example, the, the brown no description that consider the asymptotic charges. And then uh, considering the algebra that the, the asymptotic charges, um, uh, the asymptotic charges satisfy if they are conformal, um, if they, they obey the, the Virazoro algebra or not. And in this case, it's slightly harder. Uh, I, I, I'm not aware if uh, people have already done uh, the asymptotic charges in, in, in this setup, meaning with a brain inside. And the probably if uh, one needs to prove that mm -hmm. this is still a conformal interface in 2D, one really needs to um, repeat the asymptotic charges mm -hmm. consideration and find uh, what are the local charges here in this vicinity of uh, the defect. Uh, if they satisfy the, the Virazoric algebra, then we can say it is a conformal interface in that sense. But I don't know how hard it is. And I don't know if, uh, if you agree with what I'm saying, but that's what I can think of. Okay, yeah, thanks. And then uh, one one very short thing again, so the topological yeah. interface would be uh, for uh, vanishing um, right. tension. Right, uh, I don't have it here. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, continue. And um, so from there you can, uh, go up to all so this is only possible if you have uh, left and right central charge the same obviously so yeah. left and right uh, l is also the same and then you can go all the way up to uh, this upper bound that you wrote here mm -hmm. and uh, if i understood correct is this the separating uh, uh, so like uh, two two this is like the uh, the, the the defect that separates the two uh, Exactly. Is on the two sides. Right. So then the 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 brain will come somehow becomes tensionless and it will become a, a kind of fixtures brain inside the bulk. And uh, in the work, so actually I think Gutberg and uh, his students studied such kind of uh, topological uh, interface in the bulk side. And what they are considering is in terms of the uh, the Chen Simons theory, the, uh, the 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 U1 Chen Simons theory, and then they put some matching condition of the Chen Simons field, this A field, gauge field, uh, along the fixtures brain in, inside uh, in the box set, and then they consider the like the stress energy and the other CFT properties uh, in the boundary side. 
probably that would be a, um, a good place to get some flavor in this topological case. Can you can you like move them around probably and uh, like uh, has there been so done something with like fusion because like topological defects uh -huh. they normally have this very nice uh, feature of that they can, that you can fuse them together they uh, build at least in rational theories which are not holographic but like in rational theories they build a fusion algebra mm -hmm. uh, using a fusion category and stuff like that and. Uh, uh, it might be interesting to see if uh, somehow one can see these things uh, also from the. Yeah, definitely. So you, what you mean is like the brain is not necessarily in the in the middle of the ADS. It can also, since we are considering a fixtures brain, maybe the location of the brain can can vary. Is that what you had in mind? Yeah, because the the defect in the CFT, it's top. It it its name is topological because. Uh, you can basically uh, vary it as you like to. So uh, you can move it around, you can uh, put it wherever you want to, as long as you don't hit any operator insertion. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so this should be somehow be reflected also on the on the bulk side. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you move it on, on, the, on the boundary, you should also somehow move the, the brain in the bulk. And then uh, what happens in, in when you fuse to topological defect what does this mean on, on this uh, on the bulk side so what is fusion of two brains uh, tensionless brains how does this look and, and stuff like this these are just some ideas and uh, questions that might arise yeah that sounds interesting but I yeah I don't have an answer maybe <clears throat> do you have some some reference to talking about this uh, fusion of topological defect? Or do you know if anyone has already done this kind of uh, uh, holographic consideration in this topological defect? So for uh, so hol holographic in a sense, so if you look at the work of uh, uh, Runkel and mm -hmm. um, collaborators, they have this TFT description of uh, rational conformal field theory. Mm -hmm. so you have a three-dimensional topological field theory, which is kind of, you can see it as a, a gravitational theory because gravity in 3D is uh, topological, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at least if you don't have any matter. Uh, so, so there, there's this uh, dual picture of these uh, topological field theories and they have a very uh, developed description of topological defects and boundaries and stuff like this. Uh, and mm -hmm they can describe very well how to um, fuse, do the fusion and stuff like this. They don't have a description for if you go away from topological defects. So here, this seems to be uh, pretty nice if you want to describe um, a particular non-topological defects as well. Uh, so uh, yeah, so in this sense, this works better, but if you just want to talk about topological defects, this is uh, TFT description seems to be very mm -hmm. straightforward. It's also pretty mathematical. It's uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I looked at some uh, some Schweiger, Bunke, and uh, mm -hmm. who's the third person? I forgot. Schweiger, Bunke, and mm -hmm. yeah, I forgot the first person. Yeah, Schweiger, Bunke. Okay. Yeah, that sounds interesting. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, any last comment or question? Okay, if not, Dong uh, Shen, we thank you again. Thank you very much for this uh, super interesting talk. Um,